Welcome to the Durrell Annual Lecture 2023, Tortoise Tales. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. We're back at the Royal Institution here in London, the first time since 2019, after we were disrupted by COVID, of course. We have our expert team of herpetologists on hand, so if you have any questions about the lecture or our work with tortoises, please put it in the chat function and they will do their best to answer. Now, tonight, uh, we're going to have a few different speakers to illuminate the world of tortoises for you. Uh, but I'm going to begin with a bit of an introduction to the tortoises that we work with and their place in the world of humans. Now, directly behind me, behind the lectern, this is Twiggy. And Twiggy is one of our tortoises that we look after in Jersey. And you're going to hear much more about Twiggy and her uh, little <coughs> companions, actually very big companions, uh, a little bit later. But let's start. This was the simplest drawing I could find of a tortoise. But you only need a few lines on a page for everyone to recognise this animal. It's so embedded in our culture. Now, tortoises are found all over the world. They're found in the Americas, in Europe, Africa, Asia. They're very widespread. But they're also very uh, slow to reproduce. They are animals that can disappear extremely quickly. It's quite the irony for a very slow species that it will disappear fast if we don't take action. So what can we say about the tortoise? Now, some of you have heard of this, the cosmic tortoise, sometimes called the cosmic turtle. Now, that is the idea that you see all over the world in different cultures that tortoises are so pivotal that the Earth sits on the back of a tortoise in space. The tortoise was there to replace some mountain of the past. And you see this in different cultures time and time again, the idea of the cosmic tortoise. They're so embedded in our reality as humans. There's a rather more gruesome story about a turtle, there's also a cosmic turtle, where the legs of the turtle were cut off to put the Earth upon slightly more gruesome. But tortoises are symbols of good luck in many places around the world. And they're also part of our stories and morality tales. So if we move to another part of the world, Aesop, in around about mid 6th century BCE, began writing his famous fables. It's actually 725 fables. And these morality tales, <coughs> because essentially that's what they were, they were trying to teach us, they quite often feature animals over and over again. Lions, oxes, frogs. This is the famous story of the boy who cried wolf. But perhaps the most famous of them all was the tortoise and the hare. That story of the perseverance and the commitment of the slow-moving tortoise to overcome the natural ability, but bravado and attitude of the hare. Now, this is a slightly odd illustration, I think, because the tortoise is on two legs <laughs> and actually appears to be moving very quickly. <laughs> it's not really what the story told us, but also for some reason there's a mole who's adjudicating. <laughs> but it's a great image. But perhaps we, as a culture today, our first idea of the tortoise and the hare story was from the 1935 Disney film. And actually, it won an Oscar, this film best short film in 1935. <laughs> and I don't know about the rest of you, but in my head, when I think of what a tortoise sounds like if it's speaking English, it sounds like the tortoise from this film. So that kind of doleful, ponderous voice that sometimes is in our head about tortoises, this is where it comes from. Now, a little bit further on from Aesop, there is also the tortoise myths that are in North American culture, where they were revered animals revered, but also used, this is a tortoise rattle. Now, this is not an old tortoise rattle. This is on sale on Amazon right now. That's a real tortoise. So tortoises are still utilized in lots of ways. I'm gonna hear more about that later this evening as well. But of course, for most of us, our most meaningful relationship with the Chelonians, the group that makes the tortoises, the terrapins, the turtles, is because they were our pets. 
Over a million tortoises, terrapins and turtles are pets in the UK today, which is an extraordinary number, absolutely extraordinary. I had terrapins as a child, little tiny terrapins in the 1970s. It was quite, it was quite a, you know, a, a challenging environment for my terrapins because I also had a cat who liked to pick them up, rotate them like a, a crane and drop them on the carpet. So every day we had to be really careful to see where our terrapins were in the house because of this strange cat of ours who never attacked them, just liked to see what they would do if she took them out of their enclosure. <laughs> But I think many of you in this room have had turtles or terrapins or tortoises in your life. Actually, one of the first staff members we met from the Royal Institution when we came this evening has a pet tortoise that she inherited. So we had a good discussion about her tortoise. So tortoises are very important to us as humans. But why are Durrell? Why, why are we interested in turtles and tortoises? And it's, of course, because they are becoming extremely rare. And it's the usual suspects of threats that we see for many other taxa. Illegal trade is a really important one for this set of animals. And we're going to hear more from another speaker, Christian, who I'll introduce a little bit later, who's going to talk about what goes on in the illegal trade, but also there is a legal trade as well. So that is a big driver of tortoise uh, reduction in numbers. Habitat loss, that same old story. We'll hear from James, one of our other speakers, a little bit about the impact of habitat loss on Round Island and how we're trying to address that via our tortoises. Invasive species, again, Round Island is a good case study for the impact of invasive species. And now, of course, climate change. Climate change is going to change the world of tortoises as it is changing our world. So these are the big threat characteristics that tortoise face, but it is perhaps the trade in tortoise is the, that is the most alarming. And it's led to this. More than half of all Chelonians are threatened with extinction. Now, if you look at what's called the data deficient species and talk to the experts, they actually think this figure goes up to 55% endangered if we could do the full analysis. This is one of the most at-risk taxa in the world. So that is why we as Durrell want to act for these species. And here are the species we keep at the zoo in Jersey. So we have the radiated tortoise, the plowshare, then our giants, the Galapagos and the Aldabran, and the flaptail. And we'll hear a bit more from James about how we look after them and some of the very specialist care we give our tortoises. Little mention of the Ray Ray. We have confiscated Ray Ray at the zoo. We, it's how we also have our plowshare, they're from a confiscation. And very happily, the Ray Ray bred this past year. We had six, they're all survived and they're doing really well. And we've actually moved some on to our colleagues at Chester Zoo. The other thing that we should care about tortoise is, you know, we, we tend to think of animals as just the species itself, maybe benign in its environment, but of course, no animal is benign in its environment. They're all doing something in their environment, and actually tortoises are incredible ecological engineers. You're going to hear more about that from our other speakers, but here's just some of the, the ways that they impact their environment. Seed dispersal. It's not just birds that do that. It's species like tortoises. And they alter their habitats through their grazing patterns. And interestingly, on Round Island, we're using them to outgraze the invasive species as well. And their burrows get used by lots of other animals. For those burrowing species, other animals like to use them as well. And the last few photographs are from Round Island. These are Aldabrans. This was one that's called Quasimodo. And it's because she's got a bumpy shell. <laughs> She's a bit of a hunchback, but uh, she's very friendly as well. And these are the beautiful plowshare. And Christian will talk a little more about the impact that illegal wildlife trade is having on this species. They're very beautiful species. We have four in Jersey, which are confiscated animals, but we have around about 600, 700. I'm not sure the number at the moment. Um, in our breeding centre in Madagascar. 
There's only a handful of places around the world that have plowshare because they're probably functionally extinct in the wild. And we say functionally extinct, it's because there might be around about 50 animals left in the wild, only 50, but they're not the big breeding animals. And these are species that take a long time to breed. And so that's why we think they might be functionally extinct. So that's a little introduction to this evening and some of the work we do at Durrell. But I should say that this year has been the year of the tortoise for us. Uh, on Jersey, you may have seen this, uh, we had a, a giant sculpture trail uh, where we had 50 of these giant tortoises all over the island. And when I say giant, they were very big, all beautifully painted and illustrated. Uh, it created huge excitement, lots of fun for everyone across the summer. And uh, every time you went to visit one of the tortoises, we had an app that was downloaded about 11,000 times. And you could click on a little code at the tortoises, and that's called an unlock. We had nearly 700,000 unlocks over the summer. That's how excited people were about the tortoises. And actually, some of the new owners of the tortoises, because they went to auction to help raise funds for um, our work at the zoo, are in the audience today, and hopefully their giant tortoises are having a nice time in their new forever homes. So now I want to hand over to some of our other speakers to talk about the work in more detail. Um, but before I do that, I should probably talk about the context of tortoises in a, a wider fashion. So this tortoise that we use for the sculpture is kind of based on the Aldabrin, one of the big Aldabrin tortoises, similar. And one thing that we do know about tortoises is that they live for a very long time. And if we think about the changes we're seeing in our natural world, we put it in the context of one single tortoise. And that tortoise is called Jonathan. This is a real tortoise. Jonathan hatched from his egg in 1832. Today, he lives in St. Helena in the governor's mansion in the grounds. So that makes Jonathan 191 years old. Jonathan, in his very long life, has seen six British monarchs. And if you think of the length of the reign of Victoria and Elizabeth, that's quite something. He's also seen 53 British prime ministers. And I think we could all agree that sometimes it feels like 191 years. <laughs> and that perhaps Jonathan is slightly better at his job than some of them. I'll let you make your own minds up about who that is. <laughs> Jonathan has lived through two world wars, multiple pandemics. Jonathan was alive when Krakatoa exploded. Not sure if Jonathan would have heard Krakatoa because it was the year before that he emigrated from Seychelles, because he's a Seychelles subspecies, and he went to live on St. Helena. So he might not have heard Krakatoa, maybe. But he's seen a remarkable amount of things in his life, or he has been witness to an earth that has seen these things. At 191 years old, Jonathan does have some health problems, comes to us all. But I think we should also be pleased to hear he's still mating. <laughs> Hope for us all. <laughs> but Jonathan is also interesting because when Jonathan hatched, there was one billion people on this earth. There's now eight billion in Jonathan's lifetime. Eight billion of us using up the resources of the earth. Eight billion of us with needs and wants. And that is causing species like the tortoise species we're talking about this evening to be put under great pressure along with the rest of the natural world. Just in the past month, the Stockholm Resilience Centre, uh, the people who talk about the nine planetary boundaries, uh, have announced their new results. In 2009, we'd gone past three of the nine planetary boundaries, really worryingly. In 2015, it had gone to four. We'd gone past four of the planetary boundaries Today, we've gone past six of the nine planetary boundaries. We're getting closer to that stage where irreversible, potentially, damage is being done to our planet. 
all in the space of the lifetime of Jonathan. And the other thing that Jonathan and his kind have witnessed is the extinction of other species. And that can be super abundant species. We sometimes get into thinking, oh, there's 10,000 or 20,000 left. That doesn't seem that bad. Actually, they can go really quickly. During Jonathan's lifetime, the passenger pigeon went extinct. The largest ever flock of passenger pigeons was one mile wide, 300 miles long, took 14 hours to pass over the observers, and the flock was 3.7 billion, not million, billion individual animals, and they went extinct in 1914. The very last one also was famous because of her extinction, and she was called Martha, and she lived in the Cincinnati Zoo. So we give special names to special animals. Jonathan for his longevity, Martha, because she was the last of her kind. And if we don't want Jonathan to be the last of his kind, then we're going to have to act. So that seems a little gloomy, but actually it's not. This is not the time for pessimism. This is the time for optimism. This is the time to act. And this is what I hope you'll all feel galvanized to do this evening after you've heard from our other amazing speakers. One of my favorite sayings is uh, attributed to Confucius, and it is this. It is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Tonight, let's light some candles. Let's brighten this up a little. Let's find a way to solve some of these problems. We can do this. We still can do this if we all take action. Thank you. So now I'm going to hand over to Hasana. Now, unfortunately, Hasana cannot be here. Uh, he is one of our Malagasy team based at our breeding center in Ampujaroa, which is on the west coast of Madagascar. Uh, I know Ampujaroa quite well, even though it's been many years since I've been there, because I, I once spent four months in a tent there tracking another amazing species, the fossa. Uh, I'll be back in two weeks. I'll be in Madagascar, and we'll see Hasana then. Um, Hasna is our plowshare protection officer. Uh, he's been working with plowshares for many years, but he's been with Durrell 30 years nearly. Um, so he's a long-standing member of our team. So now we're going to show a little film from Hasna about work with the plowshares. <laughs> The Plasiar totus is one of the five endemic totus species of Madagascar. It has a plastron which continues under its head and then goes up in the shape of a plow. And its golden color makes it one of the most beautiful totuses in the world. Plasiar totuses are found only around Bali Bay in a tiny place on the northwest coast of Madagascar in the wild. In 1986, upon the invitation of the Malagasy government, Darrell started working with the Plauchier to set up a captive breeding program in Ampizuru and Karafanski. The objective of the captive breeding program was to constitute a safety net just in case the species went extinct in the wild. From 1998 until 2014, 105 tortoises were released into the wild. But this reintroduction program had to be halted because of the increase of poaching. Tortoises in the captive program now are meant to be released in the wild, but this has to wait until the habitat is secured. At the beginning of the project, fires were the main threat, but working with local communities has helped us to have more control. 
since the middle of the 1990s, poaching and smuggling have become the major cause for its near extinction in the wild. Please remember that Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world and those communities are among the poorest in Madagascar. Poaching exists because the gain overweighs the risks. You can get much money in taking little risks. And even if you get caught, someone will hire a lawyer to defend you. And so far, the heaviest penalty that was given was five years in prison. And this just happened once. The captive breeding centers of Ampizuru and Beavuali are guarded by armed gendarmes night and day on top of an alarm system and cameras all around. Recently, we heard a rumor which said that a famous poacher is recruiting people with the objective of attacking Beabuali. Since then, we've added the number of gendarmes in Beabuali and also recruited to villagers to monitor everyone passing in the paths leading to Beabuali. We need all this security because the plowshare is worth so much money that people are ready to indulge in extreme actions to get them. The Plasia totus has been there for millions of years, taking its time to grow and to reach maturity. And then in a matter of few decades, faces extinction. Okay, our first main speaker of the evening is Christian, Christian Plyman. Uh, we're really lucky to have Christian here with us this evening. Now, I've actually, I don't usually use bits of paper in talks, but Christian's CV is so extraordinary, I want to get it right. Uh, so, Christian retired from the Met Police Specialist Crime Directorate in, at Scotland Yard in 2011. He was a detective for 16 years service. He specialised in covert policing, spending time managing high-level human sources and infiltrating criminal gangs. It's extraordinary. Tracking drugs, firearm supply, homicide, sexual offences and general organised criminality. He has spent time in international wildlife tracking, trafficking enforcement, working in intelligence gathering and investigative roles across many countries in Eastern and Francophone uh, Africa. He has targeted illicit trade, organised criminality and the trafficking of illegal wildlife uh, products. And this has included periods at Interpol. Um, Christian started working with Durrell in Madagascar in 2018. And he's been incredibly influential in helping create and deliver training courses which are so important to the Malagasy environmental police officers, uh, the gendarmes, the customs. He's currently focusing on transnational intelligence gathering projects, supporting enforcement activity in Southeast Asia and Central Africa. Now, I could say much more. Uh, he's co-authored several academic papers on counter wildlife trafficking, um, but best to hand over to Christian and let him speak for himself. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you. Thank you for having me, Durrell, um, and of course, Green Bank. I'm uh, particularly privileged to be standing in such a venerable institution. Um, let me get rid of that picture of me. <laughs> That's much better, much more good looking. Um, so I'm going to be uh, speaking to you about uh, the, the trafficking scenarios that we face in Madagascar. Um, but first, 
allow me to give you a, a, a bit of context um, in my wonderful introduction. Yes, um, it was alluded to that I've spent several years working on counter wildlife trafficking across uh, Central uh, and Eastern Africa and to a lesser extent Southeast Asia. Um, but what I'm going to be speaking to you about today is very specific, um, a very specific composite scenario about how trafficking works within Madagascar with respect to the ploughshare tortoise in particular. Um, I say tortoise, so you might have to get used to that. Um, so just to give you um, a, a bit of a, a sort of disclaimer, the scenarios that I'm going to speak about are completely fictional, so they're composite, but they are based on reality. Okay, um, and I'm going to I'm going to introduce this uh, this trafficking chain um, in in the form of a sort of story about about people. Okay. Um, first, it's really important to understand um, from my perspective, and I speak from a very very specific perspective, bearing in mind my background. Um, about Madagascar and, and how unique it is. It's, it's unique in many, many respects. It's obviously unique environmentally. Um, you've heard my CV. I know absolutely nothing about uh, um, conservation per se. I'm not an expert in particular animals or species, but I am an expert in tackling organised criminality. But Madagascar's unique environment brings with it very specific challenges around tackling uh, criminality. It's an island, obviously. Um, it does not have the same uh, species, the same biodiversity, the same environment as other African countries where I've worked. Um, so, for example, if, if I went up to someone randomly and said, oh, I work in counter-wildlife trafficking, immediately they, they will inevitably think of elephant ivory, rhino horn, poaching on the African savanna with rangers and all that sort of stuff. Madagascar is nothing like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's extremely challenging in so many respects, uh, not least because of the different species that, that are affected by criminality uh, on the island. Geographically, it's very different. Continental Africa is landlocked, obviously. Uh, uh, certain countries are landlocked. It's a huge land mass. It's very easy to transport products over very, very porous land borders and to get them off the continent to the destination countries. Madagascar, an island, you're very, very limited as to where you're going to be able to send contraband uh, or illegally traded wildlife. And we will come on to that um, very shortly. And culturally, it's incredibly different. Um, I mean, I, I, I put the Republic of Madagascar up there in Malagasy, just to give you an indication of how culturally different it is. Malagasy, for example, is, is, a, is, a, is a language of Polynesian origin, and Madagascar is nowhere near the South Pacific. Um, so it's a phenomenally unique place. Um, I have, and I will allude to this a bit later on, but the training that I've engaged in with law enforcement agencies in Madagascar is, is culturally very, very different to what I've undertaken in continental Africa as well. Um, and, and, and in fact, the law enforcement officers I've engaged with are incredibly enthusiastic, incredibly knowledgeable, and incredibly willing to learn. Uh, and that's an important point to note um, around how Durrell is, is countering this potential threat. And again, I'll come on to that later. So let me introduce you to a few people. I'm going to introduce you to uh, four people. They are, as I said, fictional composite individuals, and I've simplified a typical trafficking chain uh, for the ploughshare tortoise in Madagascar. So this is Joel. Joel, as Hassana alluded to in his video, lives in one of the poorest communities in one of the poorest countries in the world. Okay? He lives in a rural community. He's a farmer by trade. He has a small plot of land. Um, and he probably earns, from, from, uh, uh, from his work as a farmer, he probably earns around about $15 a month, okay? Uh, I would defy anybody here to be able to survive in whatever environment on $15 a month. Um, <clears throat> Next, we have Herilar. He lives in the small town 
near to Joel's farm. Dresses like this every day. He's like a Malagasy uh, Del Boy. So he's, a, he's the man about town. He knows people. He can do things. Um, he knows how to make a quick buck. Um, he's, uh, he's motivated by having money. Okay, not too much money, but he's motivated by having money. Um, he has a good relationship with the local authorities. He will often uh, pay them some money to turn a blind eye to some of his activities, which generally include uh, illicit trade uh, in anything from counterfeit cigarettes to, uh, to narcotics. Our next character is a guy called Yi Chen. Yi Chen uh, is originally from um, uh, Guangzhou in China. Um, he has lived in Madagascar for 20 years. He's a Malagasy citizen, um, naturalized, obviously. Um, and he runs a business um, in the same town as, um, as Harilal. He runs a business uh, selling um, minerals and timber, which are mined from a local protected area. He makes a lot of money. Um, six figures a year in dollars, so he's fairly well off, or very well off in fact. I wish I earned six figures a year. Um, and he knows Herilal, he has a relationship with him, he knows him very well. He's a, he's a bit of a fixer. Because of his trade, so he exports, for example, uh, minerals that are mined, uh, or timber that is, that is logged, and he exports it over to um, Southeast Asia, to the US, to Europe, anywhere. So he has good, good contacts within the transport industry. And our final character in this um, dastardly play, whoops, excuse me, is Rashid. Uh, Rashid, fairly well-off guy, uh, he lives in Dubai. Um, he owns a chain of um, very well-established well pet stores. Um, he is able to facilitate the acquisition of any animal you like. Okay? If you live in Dubai um, and you want to festoon your luxury penthouse suite with a tiger, Rashid will get you a tiger. Okay? Um, Rashid is very open about his trade. It's not closed at all. Um, he advertises on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, on WeChat, which is very popular in China and Southeast Asia. Um, so he's very open about that. So how does it work? And again, this is very, very simplified. So we have Joel. Harry Lala bumps into Joel one day in the town and says, Hey, Joel, I know you spend a lot of time in the bush because you're a farmer, you know the ground, you know where things are. Uh, I'm after a, um, a plowshare tortoise. My friend uh, Yi Chen has got a contact that, that, that wants a plowshare tortoise. And Joel says, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Um, not, not very happy about that. I love the, love the environment. I love the countryside. I'm not too comfortable about taking animals like that. Oh, I'll give you $50. Ah, OK, says Joel. Yeah, $50. That's, uh, that's like three months' wages. That's brilliant. Yeah, I'll do that. I think I know where there, there's, a, there's a plowshare tortoise. I can go and find one. Joel goes into the bush, um, and the bush in Madagascar, thanks to its unique environment, can be many, many things. Um, and he spends three or four days in the bush with one of his friends, and they find a plowshare tortoise. Again, all of this is very simplified. Um, so he finds the plowshare tortoise, And he brings it to uh, his village, calls up Herilala, um, and Herilala visits Joel in his village and says, excellent, thank you very much, packages the tortoise up, uh, gives Joel his $50 uh, in Malagasy currency, and Herilala makes his way back to the town to go and speak to our friend uh, Yi Chen. Yi Chen, who is always after money, he's, he's got a very, uh, a, a very sort of money-savvy mindset. Despite the fact that he makes six figures a year with his trade, he, he, wants, to, he wants to make more money, effectively. Um, 
So Yi Chen, still with Herilala, uh, enlists Herilala's help to advertise the Plowshare Tortoise on social media, on Facebook. Um, you can go on to Facebook uh, and go into many, many, many Facebook groups that are Madagascar-based and find adverts for tortoises. Um, it's, it's very, very usual. It's not, uh, not unusual at all. Um, so they advertise it on Facebook, and lo and behold, um, Mr. Um, Rashid in Dubai, who has his pet store, has a very rich client who would like to add to his menagerie of luxury animals um, and wants the rarest tortoise in the world uh, to add to his stock. Um, and Mr. Rashid buys this tortoise uh, from uh, Yi Shen, um, sends him the money via wire transfer, via Western Union, something like that. Um, and it is sent by Yi Shen using his transport contacts um, over to Dubai in the Middle East. Um, this is Majanga Port, actually, in Madagascar, uh, which is a fairly big port, um, very close to the, uh, to the plowshare landscape. Um, and in our scenario, Li Shen has facilitated the exit of that plowshare tortoise all the way over to Dubai. Um, and very often from Majanga Port, contraband will go from there to one of the Indian Ocean islands like Mayotte or on occasion Mauritius, um, and from there it will travel by air to the Middle East. Uh, on occasion, products go from Majanga all the way down to the capital, Antananarivo, uh, and it will leave the island by air. Most of the smaller items, like the single animals, will leave by air. Um, and it arrives in Dubai. Um, it gets picked up by um, Rashid, who proudly displays it, um, and sells it to his client in his pet shop. Um, Hasina said in his video that the plowshares are threatened because they're very, very valuable. Um, and having, having done a bit, of a, a, a bit of contemporary analysis just before this talk, um, a plowshare tortoise retails at that at that point in the traffic, trafficking chain, retails for about $50,000. Um, and James very kindly told me that a fairly young plowshare weighs about a kilo. So that means that a plowshare tortoise is worth more than a kilo of cocaine. Um, so that's the sort of levels of, of monetary, uh, monetary value attributed to a single animal. If you think about Every step of that chain, and who's making money, it's very analogous to the drugs, the drugs trade and other illicit activities, okay? Um, the guy at the top, i.e. Rashid, is the one that's going to be profiting significantly from that. He's the one that's making the money. Uh, Joel, at the other end, has $50 in his pocket, okay? Um, so it's very, very similar to uh, all other types of illicit trade. Just plucked out of thin air, um, uh, 70 seizures from 2000 to 2015, um, which totaled just over 8,000 Malagasy tortoises, and uh, 146 of those in 15 years were plowshare tortoises, which at the retail end is $7.3 million. That, and I have to be honest with you, that is a drop in the ocean in the wider illegal wildlife trade context. But for one single species, that's absolutely horrendous. $7.3 million worth of trade in one single species um, over 15 years. And remember what Hassaner said, this is a species that comes from a tiny corner of a tiny island. It's not something that is you know, ubiquitous. It's not something that's easily uh, obtained. So it's a fairly, uh, a fairly significant trade. Before I go on to what is Durrell doing, which is very important, um, I want to just, just uh, elucidate on a couple of things. In respect to the plowshare tortoise, some of you might be thinking, well, what, do, what do people buy it for? The plowshare in particular uh, has a, is linked to a significant uh, live pet trade. 
Um, there are many other animals like great apes from Central Africa um, and some of the big cats that are linked with the live pet trade. These are very, very wealthy people who want very unique, rare animals within their, you know, as domestic pets. Um, why? Because it heightens their status, it makes them feel or seem important within their, uh, within their community, um, or they just think it looks good. It's no different to someone spending 200 grand gold plating their Lamborghini or something like that to make them look good. That's it. It's very, very similar to the sort of uh, uh, status of, of possessing ivory in certain countries. It's merely a status symbol. And the fact that these rare animals are acquired at such great cost, not only to the species, the environment, and to the people that are involved in it, especially at the bottom of the chain, um, the fact that it's just for a status symbol is, is incredibly distasteful and outrageous. Um, so what is Durrell doing about it? So since 2018, I've been working with Durrell ad hoc, I suppose you could say. So not permanently, that means. Um, uh, working with them, looking at how we can um, augment the capacity of uh, law enforcement within Ma Madagascar to try and recognise, firstly recognise the trade, and secondly, to, to do something about it, to act. The vast majority of the work that I've, I've done with, uh, with Durrell is training the authorities. Um, Training the authorities, especially in the conservation world, and I've worked for many conservation NGOs, is almost like a, can be seen as almost like a tick box, tick box exercise. Um, it's just something you arrange a training, you do the training. The work I've done with Durrell has been very, very different. Uh, it's been very, very focused on specific agencies. Um, we were one of the first uh, conservation organisations that I know of that. Um, that started doing or implemented multi-agency training. So instead of just focusing on the agencies that deal with environmental offences, we got the police, the gendarmes, the customs involved, even immigration officers, um, because these are the people that will encounter these offences. Bearing in mind ploughshare tortoises and, and other tortoises are very often illegally exported at airports. We had the airport authorities trained. I even spent five days with the authorities at Ivato Airport in uh, Antananarivo, um, spending time with them, checking people's bags and that sort of thing, which was crazy. The, the head, it's just a, a, an offshoot story, the head of the um, environmental police at the airport is a guy who's about that big, skinny as a rake, he's about 65 years old, and turns up for work in a leather biker jacket with studs all over it, combat shorts and flip-flops and he utterly despite my my training and my advice he utterly refuses to introduce himself to anybody when he searches people so he'll just go up to passengers and start rifling <laughs> through their bag he's a, he's a but he's incredibly dedicated um, and he really knows his knows his stuff as well um, and it's Pete you know regardless of his his strange demeanor and how he acts he's the, the sort of uh, agent that, that we take great pleasure in, in supporting and trying to, trying to train. Um, through COVID, we delivered a lot of training through Zoom, which was uh, very challenging, but, but nonetheless, uh, nonetheless effective. And I was able to complement that training with you know, person-to-person training. Um, why are we doing this? Why is it not a tick box, tick box exercise? That's really difficult to say. Um, it's not a tick box exercise because we have that sort of mentoring element to it. Um, I keep in touch with everybody that I've trained in, in Madagascar. I mean, generally I do, but in Madagascar in particular. Um, and I've had the opportunity to, to help them out with remotely with investigations, with identifying products that they've seized and things like that. So that longer term point of view um, is, is really important. One of the most incredible things that I've experienced with Durrell doing this sort of work uh, is the fact that they have great relationships with the Malagasy authorities, particularly with the judiciary, uh, the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of the Environment. Durrell are, um, in my experience, having worked for many NGOs, are the only NGO that have successfully managed to get to the brink 
of negotiating, implementing conservation-specific training into their fundamental um, law enforcement academies. So with the environmental police, the police and the gendarmes. This is, this is a really exciting prospect, uh, being able to train law enforcement officers at their very basic training level about the threats faced to uh, the, the species of Madagascar. Um, investigative support, I've spoken very, very briefly about. My ongoing relationships with people that I've trained through Durrell um, allow me to give advice and guidance. Um, I have even, on a couple of occasions, um, posed as a buyer for uh, Malagasy authorities, so a foreign buyer, um, just to gather information um, about specific trade. And this is very, very often to do with uh, the tortoise trade, usually radiated tortoises as opposed to plowshares. Um, but nonetheless, still very lucrative and very profitable. Um, and the, one of the other things that Durrell uh, is, is very good at uh, within Madagascar um, is, is advocacy and lobbying. So engagement with governmental authorities, with other NGOs, and internationally. Um, so Durrell were very specifically mentioned within the latest, um, uh, the latest uh, CITES um, um, CITES documentation. CITES is the Convention um, on uh, International Trade in Endangered Species. So it's a trade convention which tries to legislate um, uh, the illegal trade and legal trade um, in uh, endangered species. It's a very, very high level institution, um, but it's, it's very unusual for, for them to specifically name organisations as, as having had a contributory impact to the illegal wildlife trade. Um, they, they mention, in, I think in the document that's on the screen, they mention um, that, that the training that was delivered um, is very likely, um, based upon getting more support, very likely to be implemented by the authorities in Madagascar. Um, there's loads of stuff that we can do still. Um, I speak only from a very, very, very specific perspective. So m my perspective is dealing with the, the criminal aspect of it. Um, so there are, there are other things, things that Hassan mentioned in his video, for example, community engagement, education, uh, sensitization, demand reduction, all of those sorts of things. There's a huge swathe of, th of things that Durrell is involved in, um, but my focus is specifically around supporting that that law enforcement aspect of it. One of the great advantages that we have seen in engaging with law enforcement agencies in Madagascar is it's very long term and it's not necessarily um, as, as paradoxical as, uh, as it is to say here, it's not necessarily conservation focused. Lots of the skills we teach the officers, they have not, they've not learned before and they're very fundamental policing skills. Um, and if you have an effective law enforcement agency that operates with integrity, with ethics, um, and operates to a particular standard, then that's beneficial longer term for the entire community, for the entire region, for the entire country, ultimately. Um, and it will have an impact not only on um, uh, wildlife crime, but other environmental crime and other, uh, other criminality. Um, I, as I'm sure you, you can probably guess, I could probably talk about this for donkey's years, to be honest with you. Uh, that means thank you, by the way, so you'll be glad to know that that means I've, I've finished speaking. Um, the, the figure that I mentioned, the $7.3 million, as I said, was just for, for plowshares. Um, just so you know, globally, the illegal wildlife trade is estimated to be worth about $23 billion a year, um, which is a ridiculous figure. Um, it is oft quoted, to be honest with you, um, and that's just the stuff we know about, to, you know, to be honest. It is the fourth most prolific, uh, serious organised crime in the world after uh, drugs trafficking, firearms trafficking and human trafficking. Um, it's incredibly profitable, and the guys you see there, like, uh, um, like Rashid and Herilal and uh, um, Li Chen, who are are very often involved in other criminality as well. We see a lot of concurrence with other crimes. So it's not just about, well, it is just about the tortoises today, but generally it's not just about, 
you know, a, a sole animal. There, there's, a huge, there's a huge picture behind it, which, is, which can be complex, very dynamic, very fast moving, just like all other organized criminality. Um, but I thank you very much for your attention. Um, sorry I droned on for ages. Um, if you want to ask any questions, then there'll be an opportunity a bit later on. Thank you very much. Now, events like the annual lecture can only happen with our fantastic supporters who sponsor the event. So we'd like to say a huge thank you to Rathbones and Green Bank, who have been sponsoring the Durrell Annual Lecture since 2018. And at this point, I would like to invite Victoria Hoskins from Green Bank to say a few words about why they sponsor Durrell's Annual Lecture. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and for, I keep saying tortoise rather than tortoise. That's New Zealand versus Scotland for you. Um, anyway, good evening, fellow conservation enthusiasts. Um, we're thrilled to be back here again at the Royal Institution. Um, it's such a delight and it's such a wonderful event to see so many of you here um, and joining us for hopefully what is going to be a fascinating insight into the work of the Durrell Conservation Trust. Green Bank is the ethical and sustainable an impact investment arm of Rathbones Group. Um, and we, alongside our Rathbones International colleagues based over in Jersey, are now in our sixth year, as um, uh, um, Leslie kindly said, our sixth year of sponsorship, of supporting this annual lecture, which is an event that embodies that spirit of unity and purpose and our shared commitment to preserving our planet's rich and, um, and environmental biodiversity. To some, this might seem like a slightly strange partnership, investment managers focused on preserving and growing wealth. Um, and the charity, which is founded on that purpose of focused conservation and preservation in a natural world and saving those species, just like this tortoise, from extinction and reviving and building that natural ecosystem. However, those independencies between the natural and the financial world are real, and we need to play a part of it in this construction of that ecosystem. Green Bank has long understood the intricate relationship between finance and environmental sustainability. Our mission has always been not only to grow wealth over the long term, but to invest in a future where the prosperity of planet and people are of equal importance. We invest our clients' money to align with their values, and it's important for us to understand how the companies we invest in impact that natural world. We engage with those companies individually and collaboratively, and with other investors to push for positive change. The preservation of nature and the protection of biodiversity must be integrated into future economic and business models, and that's where we see that linkage to be of such great importance. By working with like-minded organisations looking to preserve and protect our common home, we can amplify our voice and achieve greater impact and bring the worlds of conservation and investment closer together. Durrell's mission resonates with Green Bank. We're both working towards and committed to a more sustainable future. We've both been doing that and doing what we do for some time. Green Bank has been at the forefront of ethical investing for over 20 years. For example, we were a founding member of the UK Sustainable Investment and Financial Association and have been a member since 1998. We're founding a member of Aiming for A, which was the precursor to Climate Action 100, and that was back in 2012. In 2020, we signed the Finance for Biodiversity Pledge, and in September this year, we became a participant in the Nature 100, and that's a, f um, a group focused on catalyzing greater action on nature loss. Like Durrell, we understand the changing ecosystem, and in our case, the financial one, it takes time, takes determination and the drive to face difficult challenges and overcome them. I'm sure all of, you, all of us here acknowledge the profound responsibility we share to protect and restore this delicate ecosystem that house countless fascinating and essential species. Many of these teeter on the brink of extinction and Durrell has worked tirelessly over the years to prevent the disappearance of these species and highlight the incredible and exponential effects of preserving even the smallest of these animals on wider habitats and ecosystems. 
having been fa fascinated by these issues, challenges and extraordinary results discussed in previous lectures. I think Small Creatures last year was one, was one of those. Um, I'm sure tonight's revelation regarding that humble tortoise will be equally inspiring. Our planet is our common home, but a fragile one. And the importance of Durrell's efforts to make it more resilient cannot be understated. As investors, we have a responsibility to support those efforts, and Green Bank is happy to contribute what we can. We are proud to support this annual lecture. Thank you. Uh, so, our last formal speaker of the evening is James, James Gotts, who is the team leader for Chelonians and Invertebrates at the zoo in Jersey. Um, James has been with us uh, just under a year, uh, but before that, he spent 10 years as a senior keeper at Longleat, and he has worked with many different taxa, from crocodiles to koala. He also recently was out with our field staff in uh, Madagascar, at Ampejorua, um, uh, helping advise on the care of our plowshares in, in the breeding centres in the wild as well. Now, the, the picture you can see there, that's James with Helen, Helen is an Aldabran, and as you can tell, there's a love story here. <laughs> uh, Helen, when she arrived at the zoo, fell madly in love with James immediately, and she follows him around the exhibit. But I kind of think it's mutual. By the way, <laughs> even, I mean, all of us want someone to look at us the way James is looking at Helen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so James is going to tell you a little bit about our work at the zoo, some of the pioneering work we're doing for the care of our giants at the zoo, but also about some of our work in Round Island and how we are dealing with the issues of Round Island and how giant tortoises are helping us re-establish that island for nature. So, James. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for that um, fantastic introduction. Um, yeah, my name is James Gotts, uh, team leader of Colonians and Invertebrates at Jersey Zoo. Um, like Leslie said, I've only been there for almost a year now, so I'm incredibly honoured to be here talking for you all to, uh, this evening. Um, so this evening I'm going to be talking about um, my, my favourite animals, um, uh, and that's, that's tortoises. Um, absolutely incredible, incredible animals. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about aldabras. Now, the reason I love them is they are truly ancient, ancient animals. The first time that we see tortoises, the, the earliest ancestors appearing on the fossil record is 250 million years ago. 250 million years. To put that in perspective, that's older than dinosaurs. That is older than the rings of Saturn themselves. And it really puts our little 300,000 years into real perspective. Now, as you can imagine, an animal and a species, a group of animals that have been around for that long, they've, they've changed a lot. Um, so that earliest ancestor really just looked like a lizard. Um, it had a sort of firm beginnings of a plastron. Plastron is the, the shell on the under, the chest side. And that was it. In the subsequent millions of years, after that point, it's developed into this most charismatic shape, the carapace, the shell, and probably the most famous uh, part of uh, a tortoise's adaptations. But as you can imagine, in all of that span, they've come up with different ways of utilizing and, and uh, exploiting environments. Tortoises have evolved the ability to go months without food. They go months without water, uh, some species are capable of putting themselves into dormancy to survive hard periods of time, estivation, hibernation, things like that. Some slightly more interesting abilities is that they can uh, draw water through their cloaca. Cloaca is effectively the backside. Fairly impressive. Um, but just going down that vein, uh, some species of freshwater turtles have actually evolved the ability to extract oxygen from the water around them, again, through their backside. Uh, incredible. I don't know how that begins to evolve, but there it is. But once you've evolved such a, uh, an incredible plethora of evolutionary abilities, 
What do you evolve next? That is, of course, a lifespan, a longevity. The longer you live, the more chances you have to pass on gen your genetics. And tortoises have really got that down to a T. And giant tortoises in particular can live an incredibly long period of time. So uh, Esmeralda, Esmeralda is actually a male, uh, lives on Bird Island. Um, Esmeralda is 177 years old. Currently the heaviest tortoise in the world, 305 kilos. But really pales in comparison uh, to Jonathan. So Leslie touched on Jonathan earlier. Um, Jonathan is 191 years old. Like she said, that lives on, in the governor of St. Helena's Garden, has done for the last 33 governors. When Jonathan first hatched, Queen Victoria was a teenager. But I will stress that these, uh, these two examples are animals that we know of. We don't actually know how long giant tortoises can live for because they have this really annoying ability of outliving the observer. <laughs> no one has been around long enough to watch a t an Aldabra tortoise, let's go with them, hatch from 50 grams, size of a tennis ball, take 40 years to reach fully grown, 200 kilos at that point, and then keep on going. No one's observed that entire span. So we don't know how long they can live, but there is some speculation that they can live for as long as 200, if not 250 years old. In reality, we just do not know. Now, I feel like we would go amiss if we didn't mention our oldest tortoise at the zoo. This is Zorba, he's a radiated tortoise, and I think we can all agree Zorba has one of the best smolders of any animal you've ever come across. So Zorba is 103 years old um, and a real, real character. Now, um, I was brought in uh, alongside the beginning of our newest project, um, bringing in four uh, giant Aldabra tortoises at the zoo. So uh, just to go from left to right here, um, on the left we have uh, Mike. Mike is our youngest Aldabra. He is 25 years old. He weighs 138 kilos. He's a big, big boy. Um, next, we have Twiggy. Now, Twiggy is actually one of our oldest tortoises. We've got her just there. She looks fantastic. Um, Twiggy is between 75 and 78 years old and actually has a bit of a storied history at the zoo. Uh, she was originally brought in by Gerald Durrell himself back in 1965. And she lived uh, at, Durrell's, uh, at Jersey Zoo um, for around 10 years or so before moving on to Bristol Zoo, uh, where she met up with the man, the myth, and the legend himself, Biggie. Uh, Biggie is by far our largest Aldabra. He is sitting pretty at 200 kilos, which makes him the heaviest animal in the zoo. Compare that, you know, the next heaviest is actually the Dongo, our silverback gorilla. So an incredibly large, incredibly imposing animal, but he is fantastic. He's around 80 years old. And then finally, uh, yeah, we have Helen. Um, I love Helen. <laughs> I'm not going to hide it. Um, <laughs> Helen loves me. Can we blame her? No, we can't. <laughs> she is, uh, she's 40 years old. She actually used to be someone's pet, which sort of contributes to why she likes being around people so much. And when we brought them in, they, they, they all came from Bristol Zoo. As many of you may know, Bristol Zoo has sadly closed down. So these four animals were looking for a forever home. Now, as you can imagine, it's fairly hard to house four tortoises ranging from 138 kilos all the way up to 200 kilos. They need a large amount of space, but they're incredibly specialized animals as well. So we built this tortoise tunnel um, to house them. Uh, they also have an outside paddock, but in this space, we can control the heatings, the lightings, the humidities to an incredibly fine degree. This house is truly cutting edge. We can uh, we utilize natural sunlight, that's why we've gone with the polytunnel design, um, so we can sort of focus on these uh, naturalistic photo periods. It gets light progressively, it gets dark progressively, and that helps for their behavior, their circadian rhythms, and is actually really important for tortoise and reptile husbandry. But this is effectively a test bed for a lot of the theories, a lot of the ideas uh, around tortoise husbandry that have been cultivated in the last 
15 to 20 years. So why do we have them at the zoo? So I've already touched on uh, research. Even though this species has been in captivity for almost 100 years now, we know frighteningly little about them. We don't know the optimal diets. We don't know the optimal temperatures. Um, it's actually incredibly rare for them to breed in European zoos. So what we're doing with that house, with our partners across Europe, uh, we're really starting to refine and focus in on the best practice um, guidelines uh, and how to keep these animals properly. Having them at the zoo allows us to educate the public about these incredible animals. Um, but it also allows our vet teams to work with old individuals. So we have, in our short period of time having them at the zoo, uh, we've had uh, everyone from ophthalmologists coming in, getting these baseline readings um, of what is normal for a tortoise. We have the pressure readings for a tortoise, um, for an Aldabra tortoise uh, from 25 years old all the way up to 80. Now, we can take these readings, we can compare them with other zoos, we can compare them with wild animals, and we can really start building a huge picture of what an Aldabra tortoise actually is. We also like to go with slightly less um, conventional methods of, of husbandry with them. So we have an ophthalmologist that comes in um, to work with uh, some of our tortoises to increase mobility, um, and in turn, uh, that increases uh, potential breeding successes as well. So um, he comes over a couple of times a year, he trains the staff, we get to learn a little bit about osteo uh, osteopathy in tortoises, which, as you can imagine, is fairly niche. Um, <laughs> but it allows a lot of our staff to really get in there and really understand what is actually going on underneath this shell. But despite all that, despite everything that we've learned at the zoo, I still think the most incredible thing about Aldabras and giant tortoises of the East, East Indi uh, West Indian Ocean um, is just their history. So here is a map of the West Indian Ocean. Um, so yeah, that's Aldabra just there. Um, so it's believed, some estimates put tortoises being in this part of the world at around 40 million years. 40 million years. Um, we're not entirely sure uh, where they started to populate from first. So we think it came from Africa. There seems to be uh, two um, migrations from Africa. Um, one sort of theory is that they actually bypassed Madagascar entirely. Somehow they missed this massive landmass and ended up over here to begin with. Um, and then 10 million years later, got to Madagascar and then finally radiated um, across the Indian Ocean. We know how they did it because they're actually incredibly good swimmers. This is another ability that giant tortoises have. Um, they're incredibly buoyant. Their lungs sit incredibly high in the carapace and it allows them to float very, very easily. I often compare a swimming tortoise to an armored duck. They really sit at that sort of level in the water. And we uh, had a brilliant opportunity in 2004 to really sort of comprehend what was actually going on there um, because this lovely lady, um, she washed off of Aldabra, and then seven weeks later, she arrived in Tanzania, just here, um, just going through uh, the ocean waves. Seven weeks for an Aldabra tortoise is nothing. Uh, they can go almost six months without food, um, obviously plenty of water around, so they're constantly absorbing a lot of this uh, moisture through that interesting ability I mentioned earlier. <laughs> and uh, she arrived uh, with no obvious um, problems, um, apart from being absolutely covered in um, barnacles. Uh, that was the only thing. But you can really start to understand how they've actually managed to populate these very, very sparse islands. They've migrated out, and it only takes one female to make it to an island, go up onto the beach, dig a short 30-centimetre 30, 30 hole, and lay between nine and 14 eggs, and you've got a breeding population there. Now, this brings us perfectly on to uh, Mauritius. So uh, this is Mauritius, um, little tiny island there. That is Round Island. Um, Round Island is very, very interesting. Uh, it's one of the only places in the world 
that reptiles and birds are the predominant forces on that island. Um, there is no mammalian presence. So this island has evolved in a very, very different way to many other islands across the world. Remembering tortoises have been here for 40 million years. They themselves have changed and adapted um, how the islands have actually evolved. They've been the driving force behind a lot of the evolution on these islands. But when Dowell arrived um, in, the early, uh, oh, in, in the early 70s, um, it was uh, absolutely decimated by the introduction of goats and rabbits. Goats and rabbits were introduced to the island by European seafarers as a replacement food source um, after they completely wiped out the local tortoise population. And as you can see, the island was in complete disrepair. There was nothing there. It was barren. Believe it or not, there were a couple of reptile species that were still clinging on. They were all critically endangered. Bird populations were struggling. It was really collapsing. This was it. European seafarers entering this area. The predominant export from these islands at this period of time during the 16 and 1700s uh, was actually tortoise oil. Tortoises on, on Round Island, on Mauritius, uh, and throughout the Indian Ocean were, were refined and boiled down for oil. For one barrel, I saw an estimate earlier, I read it up, um, between 400 and 500 animals would have been needed to make one barrel of oil. These are animals that take 25 to 26 years to reach sexual maturity. These are animals that take 40 years to reach full maturity. You can just imagine that 400 to 500 animals, just to make one barrel, was absolutely decimating to these populations. And it wasn't just tortoises that were affected. It was also, quite famously, dodos and grey parakeets. Um, the introduction of humans to this area was absolutely catastrophic. So what was Durrell doing? So when Durrell arrived in the uh, early 70s, the island was, was absolutely, like I said, just wrecked. There was nothing else left. And you can see from this, this uh, um, picture that there is nothing. It's a barren landscape. This landscape should be uh, a mosaic of palm savannah, effectively. But there really was nothing left. We started off with the eradication of goats and rabbits to the island. They weren't meant to be there. These islands were so fragile, they just hadn't evolved to take on that mammalian grazing pressure at all. Um, so with the removal of the goats and rabbits, uh, we saw a couple of effects, some that we weren't expecting. Everything started recovering, but it all started recovering at the wrong rates. Uh, grasses, uh, invasive grass species um, and plant species were recovering a heck of a lot faster than these native species, and we couldn't really figure out why. Um, once, the, once we removed these, uh, these, these um, uh, goats and rabbits, uh, we really took stock of what we had left. That was it. One hurricane palm, <laughs> six bottle palms, there was, honestly, I cannot stress this enough, nothing left on this island. But we had a plan. So in 2007, we started up a, a project, a little study. What would happen if we introduced tortoises back to this island? Um, we started off with 24 animals. We started off with 12 juvenile Aldabra tortoises, the only closest living relative to the Mauritian giant tortoise. We also started off with 12 adult uh, radiated tortoises, just like Zorba. And we put them in uh, pens uh, and just basically observed what they would do with the invasive plant species. How would they affect this? And it was incredibly positive. We it took a year. Um, we saw it all. OK, great. It works in confined spaces. In 2008, we introduced them to the rest of the island. We saw huge benefits to this. It was effectively free labor. These tortoises were going through. They were eating the invasive grass species, species that hadn't evolved alongside tortoise herbivory. Other species on this island require their seeds to be digested by, plant, uh, by tortoises, specifically tortoises, 
go through their digestive system in order to germinate. Certain species require this heavy um, grazing pressure in order to get above the grass. So they're so instrumental in these islands. They really are a foundation and a key stone species. Today, there's now over 800 Aldabras on Round Island um, from that original 12. We've introduced more and more as the years go on, and we're actually getting to a very, very good place with it. This is a couple of photos now. So that was the first photo up in the top left corner that we showed. Um, this is just a couple of years later. You can see that um, alongside manual planting, the landscape is starting to change. Again, it's becoming more lush. There's actually some life there. So now, as of this year, we've planted 37,000 uh, plants on, on the island, um, focusing predominantly on hardwood plants. These are the structures of the island. This is what we need to get in situate, uh, situated first before we can start moving forward with any other um, introductions and plant species. But you can just see that the island uh, has just changed dramatically in these 16 years from 2000 uh, 2002 to now. You can just see that it's just bursting with life. It's just changed entirely. And it's purely down to tortoises and their grazing habits. So you can see on the left-hand side there, that is an area that hasn't been grazed by tortoises at all. Um, to put that in perspective, that grass is around knee height. Nothing can get above that. Um, saplings, new plants, they just can't get above this, this shade and thicket layer. Whereas on the right, um, you can see uh, three tortoises absolutely decimating those plants. Um, and they will literally just sit there in one spot and just eat everything around them. And then they'll move a little bit further forward and just do it again. And you see the same behavior out, uh, in Jersey Zoo when we let them out into the outside paddock. They create this fantastic tortoise width um, trails all the way across the paddock in sort of S shapes. It's fantastic to watch. Um, but they'll just do that all day long. Um, and you can see that they've really changed the habitat there. Make no mistake, this is one of the most interesting projects I think Daryl has on the go at the moment. What we're doing is resurrecting an entire ecosystem. It was dead. It was gone. The introduction of these tortoises has actually started to bring life back to this island. And because of Daryl, because of the partners in that region, um, I'd say that uh, Rand Island, although it has a very long way to go, uh, there is a very, very bright future there. So I'd like to thank you very much for, for listening. Um, again, as, as you could probably tell, I, I love tortoises. I, I could talk about them a lot. So if you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to ask. Um, I love, love talking about them. But I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much for your continued support of Daryl. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our lecture this evening and you're feeling inspired about how you can help tortoises. We hope we've demonstrated our work in saving species like the tortoises and how our impact can be extremely effective. With your support, Durrell's dedicated team can continue to help support these incredible animals, saving them for the future. Here are some examples how a gift from you today can help our work in conserving these precious reptiles for the future. 50 pounds can contribute to buying weighing scales for the giant Aldabra tortoises found on Round Island. 120 pounds could buy equipment for our patrollers in Madagascar protecting the precious plowshare and ray ray turtles. 250 pounds could help reintroduce plant species onto Round Island, plant species that would have been there in the past that will help give the grazing for our precious Aldabran tortoises, which are also on Round Island. 500 pounds can help contribute to the veterinary care for our plowshares and ray rays at our breeding center in Madagascar. Thank you for all your support to the team at Durrell, wherever they are around the world, protecting tortoises.